In the last tutorial, we've created this UI you see here. But how does it actually work? Well, let me explain. If you select the UI root, you will actually see a script attached to it called UI root. What this script does is it actually scales this game object by the inverse of the screen's height. This allows all the children to be in the pixel coordinates without them being massive on the screen and in your game. In this case, it's also set to be automatic, which means that if I actually resize the window, this value will be adjusted, and so will the scale. This is useful if you want your uh, UI to remain the same size on the screen in pixels. If you don't, just get rid of this script. Or better yet, keep it, but uncheck the automatic selection and set the screen height yourself. For example, if you were targeting an iPad device, you would put 768 here, because the resolution of the iPad is 1024 by 768. Since the UI was actually created at a lower resolution, you will notice that it actually shrunk on the screen. It's because of this that I suggest you create your UI with a target resolution in mind. But in my case, I'm just keeping it simple, and I want it to be automatic. Well, let's move on to the next object, the camera. The camera that we created with the UI creation tool, this one, was actually placed on the layer that you specified. See the default layer here? Default calling mask here? and default layer here, they all match. If we were to create it with another layer, say for example a 2D layer, they would all be 2D. Chances are, after this, you're probably going to want to import NGUI into an existing project, your project, which already has a bunch of cameras in it. So before using NGUI, you will want to set up a layer that will be used by only your UI. And you will also want to make sure that your main camera and all the other in-game cameras can't see this layer. You have to make sure that only the UI can see this layer. Unless, of course, you really want to have uh, your UI show up in the game. Maybe you want an in-game HUD. I mean, that's up to you. In any case, moving on. On the camera, you can see the UI camera script attached. UI camera script is what is actually responsible for sending out all the events within GUI. On, the, on hover, on press, on click, all the events come from the camera. And the events are also not limited to widgets. Anything can receive an event as long as it has a collider. In order to receive an event, all you need is a mono behavior in there that uh, implements one of the functions on click, on hover, and so on. If you want to know more, there's a fairly good write-up on the website about it. Well, let's move on to the next object. Select the anchor. The anchor script has several uses. It can be used to attach widgets and other objects to sides and corners of the screen. You do that by changing this part right here, the side. If you change it to the left, it's going to be attached to the left side of the screen, and that's going to be its pivot point. Bottom left, top, and so on. Whatever you want. This is useful for creation of UIs that are glued to sides of the screen. For example, if you were creating a World of Warcraft kind of a game, and wanted to create a quest log that is always attached to the right side of the screen, you would change this to be right and create your UI like that. But in my case, I'm sticking with center. The half pixel offset right here is what allows your UI to look crisp on Windows machines. This only applies to 2D UIs. And again, if you want to read up more on this particular oddity, there's more information on the website. Stretch to fill is an option that allows you to create tiled backgrounds that stretch and fill the area of the screen. Actually, let me just show you. 
select the panel, switch to the widget tool, and I'm gonna want to add a tiled sprite, honeycomb, add it to the panel, and then add UI anchor. UI anchor, and I'm gonna want it to stretch. I'll also want to change the pivot point to be uh, top left, and here we go. Now, of course, chances are you don't want it to overlay your entire UI. And you bring it back by using the depth right here. Depth only works if you're working with widgets from the same atlas. If you're working with widgets from different atlases, you'll need to adjust the z-coordinate instead. In this case, since everything is on the same atlas, I'm just going to go ahead and bring it back until it's negative 1. And now it's behind everything. I can give it a different color tint, and now the entire UI has a background. If you zoom out, you will actually see that only the area that is visible by the screen actually gets the geometry. Well, let's get rid of it. This leaves only one other parameter on the UI anchor, the depth offset. The depth offset is used to bring things back or forward when uh, working with the uh, 3D UIs. But since we're working with the 2D UI in this case, we can safely skip it. Let's move on to the next object, the panel. The panel has a UI panel script on it, and UI panel is what is responsible for collecting all the widgets under it and creating as few draw calls as possible in order to uh, render them on a screen. UI panel internally also has a list of all the children that it has with widgets on them. And uh, it keeps track of things that have changed. So for example, if you move a widget, UI panel will check has it moved? If it has, only then would it actually recreate the geometry. Otherwise, it will remain as is, and it will not be touched. This results in better performance. UI panel itself can also be moved at any time, and it will not cause the widgets to uh, rebuild their geometry. This is useful to have for devices that have limited graphics capabilities, like mobile phones. You can achieve much better performance by moving the panel around than moving individual widgets. Moving on, there's the button game object. The button game object is just a container with a collider on it. A container that has a label and a sprite. The sprite is used to create the background for the button and the label to create the text. This is how an GUI works in general. You don't actually have complex widgets with thousands of lines of code that do a very specific thing. No, not within GUI. Within GUI, you have very basic components and scripts that can be attached to those components to make them do something. For example, in order to highlight this button, there's the UI button color script attached to it. This simple script simply watches for events, hover event and pressed events, and changes the color of the tween target accordingly. Oh, and it is a tween, by the way it actually triggers a tween of a color on the slice sprite. And slice sprite is the background. Then there's the button scale, which simply scales the button up. And again, it's the same thing. Hover event and pressed event. When it's hovered, the button is going to be 10% bigger. And when it's pressed, it's going to be 5% bigger. Now, these scripts can actually work with more than just widgets. Here I'm pointing to a slice sprite in the button color, but I don't have to. I can actually point to a light or even a render with a material on it, and it will change the color of it just fine. Same thing with the scale. I'm scaling a game object here, and it doesn't need to be a button. I can scale a 3D object. I can attach this uh, button scale script to, uh, say, a, a character model in the game, and when the mouse hovers over it, the character will be increased in size. But that's all fine and dandy, of course, but say if I wanted to uh, change this a bit, how would I do it? Simple. Instead of making this button grow in all directions, let's make it grow only in a horizontal direction. We do that by changing this Y and Z to 1, while increasing the X, say 1.4. Now, if we run it, 
and hover over it, hey, look what happens. It actually grows in a specific direction. Then there's the button offset script, and it does exactly what you think it does. It simply positions the object two pixels to the right and two pixels down when it's pressed. And of course the button sound script. All it does is it plays a sound. In this case it's on click, but there are other events. On mouse over and mouse out, press, release. Keep in mind you can actually create uh, multiple scripts and attach them to the button. For example, if I wanted to add another sound event, I would search for UI button sound and add it here. Now I have two of them. This one I'm going to switch to on mouse over. And instead of the tap, I'm going to play another one. Say, for example, swipe. Now if I hit play, simple. Now, of course, you can attach this to anything as long as it has a collider. It doesn't need to be a widget. Now, let's move on to the checkbox. The checkbox uses the color script and the scale scripts exactly the same way the button does. This is what I was saying. They can be attached to anything. It doesn't need to be a button. It just needs to have a collider. Same thing with the sound. Now, the main difference between the checkbox and the button is the UI checkbox script. UI checkbox script is used to keep uh, st the state of the checkbox and to fade out the sprite for the checkmark itself. Alternatively, you can also specify an animation to play if your checkmark actually has it. You can also specify the event receiver and the function name to call when the state of the checkbox changes. Now, let's make this checkbox more interesting by adding an animation. And GUI actually comes with an animation for a checkbox. So, let's clear this right here. We're not going to need to fade out the sprite anymore. We're going to let the animation do it. Now, animation is designed to work with a plain game object, while our sprite is actually uh, the scale of 22 by 20, which is a little big. So we need to create a new game object under the checkbox. We do that by holding Alt Shift N by adding a new child. We're gonna call it animation. And this animation is gonna contain the sprite. This animation will also have the animation in it. And GUI examples animations folder has the checkmark animation drag and drop it onto the animation game object we've just created. You will want to uncheck the play automatically checkbox right here because you don't want it to start playing right away. Now select the checkbox and drag the animation node onto the check animation field right here. And that's it. Let's see what happens. Well, that's a little bit more interesting. Now we can do the same thing with the button. Instead of animating it using the scale and the color, we can attach this button animation to it. Let's do that. We're going to want to place both label and sprite game objects under it. And put the button animation on this game object. Uncheck play automatically. And one last thing. We want the UI play uh, button play animation script. This one right here. Attach it to the button itself. Specify the target animation and when to do it. We're gonna want to do it on hover. Play direction forward. Just leave everything else on default values. Uncheck the scale and uh, well, it's good enough. Let's see what happens. Hmm, that's a bit more interesting. And let's have a little bit more fun. Let's make the window do the same thing as the button. We do that by selecting the panel. And uh, right now the panel cannot receive events because it doesn't have a collider on it. So let's fix that. And GUI, attach your collider. Now it has a collider and now it's capable of receiving events. Now we just need to add the UI button play animation script to it and an actual animation, say the button animation. 
drag and drop the animation into this target field, uh, uncheck play automatically, and let's set this to be on hover. And let's see what happens. Interesting. Pointless, but interesting. I'm just gonna clean this up. Now, let's create a group of radio buttons. We do that by reusing the checkbox. Select the checkbox and co copy and paste it a couple of times using Control C, Control V. Now there's three of them. In order to turn them into a, a set of radio buttons, all we have to do is select the Option field right here on each of them. And now when we play, only one of them can be selected at a time. If you wanted to create more than one group, you can. Uh, by default, only checkboxes under the same game object get grouped into an option group. So, let's create a couple more checkboxes. One checkbox, second checkbox, and we're gonna group them together by a common game object. Call this game object group1. We're gonna drag a couple of them to this new group. And the remainder will go on another group, group 2. Now if we hit play, they work independently. Now let's create a label. I'm going to add it to the panel and position it off to the side. On a label, you can actually specify the maximum line width right here. For example, 100. Now if you start typing, start typing something like this, you'll notice that it actually automatically gets word wrapped. Unless, of course, the multi-line is unchecked, in which case it's just going to get cut off. You can also turn any label into an input field by simply attaching a UI input or UI input saved to it. Input saved actually saves values to player press. I'm gonna go with that. It'll also need a collider in order to receive the events. So I'm gonna add a collider to it. For the player prefs field where the values will be saved, I'm gonna type any value. It doesn't matter as long as it's unique. Now when I hit play, and click here, I can actually type. And best of all, when you stop it and then start it up again, your value will still be here. This is useful for such things as uh, username or password fields. Speaking of password fields, you can actually uh, turn this into a password field by checking the checkbox on a label. Now it's a password field. It still has the same values in it. You just can't see them. If you don't want to create complex animations using the animation tool in Unity, you can actually create some simple twin-based animations instead. For example, if I wanted this text to uh, keep rotating, I would attach tween rotation. For all of the tween scripts, you can actually specify the method of tweening linear, is in, is out, is in and out. And you can specify a style. Once, we'll play it once and then disable the tween. Loop, we'll play it from the beginning to the end and then back to the beginning. Ping pong, we'll play it from the beginning to the end and then play it toward the beginning rather than restarting at the beginning. I'm gonna start with ping pong. Now I have to specify a from rotation and a to rotation that uh, negative 30 for example. Now when I hit play, let's see what happens. It just rotates back and forth. If you want to create more advanced animations, I suggest you use the animation tool in Unity. It is very powerful. Then instead of tween stuff, you will be using uh, animation based components. 
UI button play animation, for example, will trigger an animation when you click on it, or uh, hover, or any other event of your choice. You can even use an GUI to create some sprite-based animations by using the UI sprite animations uh, components, but I'll let you experiment with that one. Fortunately, it's fairly straightforward. Well, m let's move on to the last component we've added in a previous tutorial, the slider. The slider itself simply contains a UI slider script on it, as well as the collider that lets it receive the events. The foreground parameter specifies the object that will be scaled with the slider's value. The thumb specifies the object that will be at the end of the filled bar. The foreground is optional, but the thumb is usually uh, pretty useful to have for an actual slider. The direction specifies the direction of the slider, horizontal or vertical. The event receiver and the function name let you send out notifications to a remote game object when the slider's value changes. And that's all there is to it. Now, let's uh, move on to something more interesting. Let's make this window draggable. You do that by selecting the panel and attaching a collider to it. We also want to attach a UI drag, a UI drag object in this case. For the target, just specify the panel itself. For the drag, let's stick with none for now. Hit play and see what happens. Hey, it's draggable. You can also specify the drag effect of something like momentum and spring, which will uh, change the behavior a bit to make it behave more like an iOS style control. To see how it's used, look at example 7. Now let's take a look at uh, the two other tools that come within GUI, the panel tool and the camera tool. In order for this uh, to make sense, we should open up a scene that actually has more than one panel and more than one camera. Example 3 should do. Now, If you open up example 3, you will notice that there's three different cameras and three different panels in the scene. With the camera tool, you can actually disable different cameras if you happen to be debugging something. With the camera tool you can also quickly change the mask of the camera. This is the calling mask that you can find by selecting the camera itself right here. If I was to change this to uh, 3D UI for example then I'll see all the 3D UI stuff. I can also quickly enable and disable event processing by unchecking or checking these checkboxes. I can quickly navigate to the camera in question just by clicking the select button. It's the same thing with panels. Select to navigate, check and uncheck to enable or disable, and it tells you which layer the panel is on, as well as how many widgets it's managing, and how many draw calls it's producing. The clip part will uh, tell you whether the panel actually has clipping enabled. If I wanted to debug something, for example uh, the geometry that uh, one of my panels is creating doesn't seem quite right, I can always simply navigate to the widget in question which tells me which panel is drawing it and then I can check the debug button right here. And then if I try to select the widget again I will actually get the widget's geometry instead which lets me see exactly what happens under the hood. And that concludes the second tutorial. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have fun playing with NGUI.